Uh, Drew Clark was appointed the Secretary of the Commonwealth Department of Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy in March 2013. His portfolio includes the ABC, so he's sometimes my boss, so I've got to be really uh, spot on here. No, I'm only joking. Um, he reports to um, Malcolm Turnbull uh, and um, gives us a, a, a a view of open data policy that will hopefully uh, inform us for the rest of this conference because it really is a, a deep view. So would you please welcome to the stage, Drew Clark. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ruben, and thank you to the organisers of uh, Pivotal for the opportunity to talk to you. So, uh, there's been four great presentations, and now I'm going to talk about policy. Uh, so <laughs> that's the role of the government dude, I'm sorry. Uh, but I'll try and make it uh, a bit interesting and, and have some examples. But I, I think, as Ruben has said, uh, the previous presentation, indeed, the ones in the opening session, really have laid the groundwork for what I want to talk about very well. I'm wearing two hats. I have a, a Commonwealth uh, government bureaucrat's hat, but for the last four years, I've also had the privilege of chairing ANSLIC, the Australian Spatial Information Council, comprising uh, all of the Australian governments and New Zealand. So, the value of spatial in an open data economy. That didn't work. Try that. There you go. So data produced and held by the government as a result of administrative and policy interactions with the public is, of course, everyone in this room would understand, a valuable national asset. Although it's a policy requirement to collect and analyse data, until recently there's been limited scope to realise the full value of the data. Three drivers influencing economic value of open data, new business, more efficient interaction between government and uh, citizens in the private sector, and, more, and a more efficient operating practices within government itself. Uh, the last presentation was an exemplar. 2013 report by PwC estimated that data-driven innovation added $67 billion in new value to the Australian economy, 4.4% of GDP. However, the same report indicated there was substantial room to improve, with an estimated $48 billion left on the table in potential value from data-driven innovation. So the full potential of government information is yet to be exploited. The policy response to this by most governments is to adopt open access or open data, a fundamental shift in philosophy that potentially reforms many core government information processes, starting from the way information is collected. For the Commonwealth, since September 2013, a total of 6,200 open data sets have been added to data.gov.au. That's 6,200, Ruben, I know you're taking notes. Uh, 2,200 of those delivered as open web services for viewing through our national map interface, developed by our colleagues at NICTA. And similar initiatives are taking place in most jurisdictions, most notably Queensland, where there was, again, an exemplar of this approach uh, highlighted during the recent G20 meetings. So the process chain for open data. Government generally collects data to meet a government requirement. But the fact that we've collected data for that one or two internal purposes does not mean it can't be used by others for other purposes. I would argue, though, that what we in government should be doing is considering this data as a service. As we transition our thinking from an open data model of build it and they will come, post it and the market will find it, if you like, to data as a service, as a problem solver, we have to consider where go government can work best and where the private sector can best contribute. Government efficiency is improved when government no longer, or rarely, needs to develop multiple specific apps and websites to communicate data and information with end users. The private sector can then fuse multiple data sets to generate new business, products and services, or to create social value. Efficiency across the private sector is achieved by removing duplicative work uh, when engaging with government. An example, the budget itself. We released uh, this year uh, the open budget. Uh, that enabled the financial and economic sector to deconstruct 
uh, to directly access the underlying data tables rather than attempting to deconstruct PDFs, which has been the past practice. Of course, there may continue to be areas of market failure that will result in government presenting data sets and developing apps and websites, perhaps through a lack of commercialisation or a need to ensure some sort of government authority or integrity around the data. But I'd suggest that increasingly, those instances should be in the minority, not the majority. And this is a very significant shift in the way government thinks about its own role and in the way in which bureaucrats think about our jobs. So I want to talk about uh, a little case study for the Commonwealth about increasing the availability of Commonwealth open data. Spatial information, of course, is a critical component of the open data story. Most spatial information is free of privacy and legislative barriers, and of course, when fused with other data types, significantly increases the value of both. So this graph is uh, to demonstrate the importance that spatial information has played in the Commonwealth's open data agenda. The vertical axis is the number of data sets available through data.gov.au. As you can see on this graph, there have been a, a number of uh, step changes. This is due to our policy of networking open data sets through established spatial infrastructures. It was less about creating new or suddenly releasing what was closed. It was about improving access in many cases. So the first significant increase was due to networking with Geoscience Australia and the second due to networking through the FIND application and through it the other spatial infrastructures it accesses. So this is linking through to the globes uh, underway uh, being built in the states and territories and various research bodies. You might note also that there's one of the kick-ups was due to the addition of some PSMA data sets. While open data is being led by government, there's an important role for the private sector, if those in the private sector would forgive me characterising PSMA in that way. But it's certainly our view that the milestone of an open administrative boundary data set is just as noteworthy as the big increases in open government data. I want to talk a little now about uh, the FSDF, the Foundation Spatial Data Framework. So this is the, the flagship program of ANSLIC, where the Australian and New Zealand governments have long recognised this need to develop an agreed Foundation Spatial Data Framework, easy access to authoritative government spatial data. ANSLIC, of course, is the peak national spatial government's bodies comprising as equal part partners the Commonwealth Government, the New Zealand Government and the governments of the Australian states and territories. Our strategic objective is around access to national level spatial data to be as easy as possible. These, uh, these ten governments have a long history of close collaboration and through ANSLIC have undertaken to develop this one uh, Australia and New Zealand FSDF. We identified 10 data themes for the framework under which the national data sets can be grouped. You can see the themes there, geocoded addressing, administrative boundaries, positioning, place names, land parcel and property, imagery, transport, water, elevation and depth and land cover. This is a holistic program focused on evolution, not waiting and doing it. In ICT language, the development methodology is more agile than waterfall. The data sets in these themes underpin data integration and analytics in multiple sectors, emergency services we've just heard about, health, education, you name it. Since the release of the FSDF in 2014, the three levels of government have been working closely on delivering on the improvements that we articulated in that documentation. We've recently published 10 three-year roadmaps that outline the vision of this, uh, this project to our partners and stakeholders. We're trying to follow four principles in this work. First, user consultation. What does the user want? Not a bad place to start. Second, transparency. Call it like it is. The data is not of the quality that we'd like. Spell it out. It is what it is, but be plain and transparent about it. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. 
Third, pragmatism. Don't let, don't let the search for perfection uh, get in the way of adding some value. And fourth, whatever we think is the framework today, we're sure it's going to change. Be ready to adapt and change. So, in the interest of transparency, here's a recent uh, review that we've, uh, that we've done, and we talk about this at ANSLIC at the Council, uh, about the status of our national level data sets. So these graphs give you a, a high level overview of where we're at on pricing policy, licensing and online access. This was current as at April 2015. I say the currency of course because these things change and it's a fairly simplistic model, a three categorization model. The, the actual data uh, information or metadata if you like for each of these data sets is of course much richer. But the green broadly represents those data sets that have met our stated open goal. Yellow partially and red represents data that's still restricted or in some cases uh, not available on the internet at all today. Now the variations that you observe in these graphs are, are essentially an artefact of our federation. ANSLIC has no executive authority, we can't direct a jurisdiction as to how to deal with its data and we have no budget. Uh, this is all done by consensus and cooperation across the ten governments. An example, and this, this relates so well to uh, some of the earlier slides, the, uh, earlier presentations that we had this morning. Water observations from space. So this is a good example of high value open data to the economy through unlocking of the Landsat archive. What's really interesting about this is that it's problem driven and covers the areas of big data, open data, data analytics and data visualisation. And it's at no cost to the end user. It's integral to our FSDF project. The water observations from space data is derived from Landsat 5 and Landsat 7 data uh, acquired over Australia for over 27 years between 1987 and 2014. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands of images acquired during that time and until recently only accessible through an archive on request and a quite high cost to process. Uh, the project that Stuart Minchin and his team at Geoscience Australia has accomplished, along with their many partners, has been quite revolutionary. They leveraged off a change of licensing conditions uh, in the Landsat program in the US and of course they leveraged uh, a massive increased availability of computing power. So they've distilled all of that information into a set of easily consumed web services services that allow the general public to understand the availability over time of surface water across Australia. This image uh, is the third of five layers of information provided in the product. The inset is Lake Eyre of course which demonstrates the resolution of the data. This layer depicts the ratio, the number of times that water was detected across Australia on the surface between 1987 and 2014 with the number of times that a clear observation was made at each location. The ratio is then displayed as a percentage. Green indicates water detected in 20% of the observations, red 1%. So I commend Geoscience Australia in not only taking a leading role in this project, but delivering an exemplar under the FSDF principles. Now, if you start to shift your mind about uh, within government towards data as a service and you look back at much of what I've talked about so far, what's obviously missing is the private sector's point of view. Perhaps the FSDF user consultation uh, was a notable exception to that, but by and large, I think it's a fair criticism. A lot of this is government talking to itself, government talking to government about government. So to address this, a uh, project in my department has begun in collaboration with New York University called Open Data 500 Australia. The study is the first of a series of engagements with those Australian companies and, uh, and non-government organisations that use open government data to generate new business, to do their work in new products and services or to create social value. This collaboration between the Department of Communications and GovLab, 
at New York University, is intended to create new case studies on how Australian organisations are using public sector data and to provide a basis for assessing the social and economic value of open government data sets. Participation in the study will provide us with valuable information about those use cases and give organisations an opportunity to request particular public sector data sets that would be of value to their business if made open. What do you, the user community, want government to release under these open data principles? This should drive our own programs. So this is the first phase in consulting with the private sector on open government data. The next will be engagement on a broader scale to understand how the data can, be, can become more accessible and usable, uh, and particularly talking to those businesses that are not currently accessing open data. Why aren't you, how can we get you into this? So the contact details are on the slide and it's a great opportunity for those that are interested in pushing this agenda to participate. Last slide. I want to come back to how spatial data pulls all this together, this open data story. So I'll start with that core definition of big data that's been around for a couple of years, that it's around volume. In 2002, it took the whole year to uh, create 5 billion gigabytes of data. Now we create 5 billion gigabytes in two days. That will keep getting steeper, that curve. Velocity everything connected to everything else in real time, the Internet of Things, and variety from anything, from everywhere, uh, and as we move back deeper into the archive through the Landsat programs, the variety gets even greater. I would add to those three Vs, veracity, uh, the quality, uh, the metadata, transparency, but also value. Not all these data sets have the equivalent value. The value of spatial information though, particularly open foundation spatial information, is that it integrates these new technologies. The Internet of Things, BIM, big data analytics, smart cities, all of these things that the user community is involved in, uh, spatial has a role to play. I would expect that the governance models, the supply chains, the roles of the public and private sector and the applications themselves they will all be disrupted many times over as we go down this journey. Every year, new and on shorter cycles, change, disruption, recalibrate, uh, move forward. That's the nature uh, of a modern digital economy and, it, and it's what makes working in the open data field so exciting. Thank you. <laughs>